You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews. How are you all? Are you okay? Well, this is what's happened to me in the last week. So it's fair to say that um, my weight isn't exactly going in the direction I would like it to. I do find when the children are at home on school holidays, it makes it much harder. But anyway, so that is the problem. And then picture this. I am on one of my runs. Well, we use the term run advisedly. I am moving faster than I walk. When ping, I have a message from my scales. So this is this new pair of scales I've got that you stand on and it sends all the data to your phone and it, I don't know, analyzes everything, bone density, number of brain cells. No, maybe not that, Um, but lots of different things. And you get all these full breakdowns and tracking metabolic age and oh my goodness, scary stuff. But while I was on a run, the scale sent me this message and I thought, oh my goodness, they know I've put so much weight on. They're sending me this message to say, you need to run faster if you want the numbers to look any better. So yeah, I was a little bit shocked. I've never had anything like that before. Anyway, then today, the next day I get this message from them apologising for sending a message in error. So I don't, I don't know what's going on. I've never had a set of scales text me while I'm on a run before. But I did think it was quite strange. But never mind. What's not strange is the great books I've got to talk to you about today. Some really, really good ones. Quite a selection. There's going to be at least, well, how many books are we looking at today? Five. Uh, There could be five books that you're interested in acquiring, I think, quite possibly. But um, well, let, let me talk you through what have we got. So we've got In Cold Blood by Adam Croft. Uh, And we're going to speak to Adam as well in in a little bit, which is great. We've got Slow Fire Burning by Paula Hawkins, which is out the 31st of August. We've got Yours Cheerfully by AJ Pierce. Uh, Next of Kin by Kia Abdullah, which is out on the 2nd of September. And finally, we've got The Flight by Julie Clark. So lots of good books. But before that, we need to. Oh, there's some things I need to say thank you for. Let me grab my list really quickly. You see, I was trying to be organised and efficient and I knew exactly what I was doing. But I need to say a massive thank you to Suze333. Suze, whoever you are, thank you so much for your review on Apple Podcasts. It it does help so much. Um, You had such lovely words and it was very kind and it made me feel very very blessed. So thank you, Suze333, for your wonderful review on Apple iTunes. Oh, now don't forget there's a Spotify playlist. Um, so if you're thinking, oh, I've, sometimes I find it hard to focus on a book and my mind wanders and all of that. Uh, if you go onto Spotify and type in Quick Book Reviews, yes, you'll have the podcast there, but you'll also have a reading playlist. And it seems to be quite helpful for people. I'm getting um, a lovely feedback from you all. Thank you. about how it is helping you focus. You only listen to it when you're reading, no other time. And you just put it on and phone down, not looking at it and pick up a book. Uh, that's not me saying you have to listen to it or you must read. But just if that's something you fancy, it, it's worth worth a listen and you can subscribe to it as well. Um, oh, and we've got a book box opening because I've had quite a few messages from listeners saying we haven't had a book box opening for a while. They make us laugh. Please do one. So we do. And with a different box. This is very exciting. I have no idea what to expect from this one. Hopefully it's all good. Uh, But let's just deal with the wonderful Facebook group, the Quick Book Reviews Facebook group um, and what you are all reading. So currently, Leslie is reading Rules for Perfect Readers. Rules for Perfect Readers. You see, I've written that down and I even know that's wrong. This, This shows the rush I was in. Leslie's reading Rules for Perfect Murders by Peter Swanson. Um, So I was reading The Marlowe Murder Club by uh, Robert Thorogood and Ali is reading that one as well. Vic is reading Billy Boyle by James R. Ben. Laura's reading Exit by Belinda Barr. Jahan's reading Worst Case Scenario by Helen Fitzgerald. Debbie's reading A Room Full of Bones by Ellie Griffiths. We've got Annette reading The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter by Theodora Goss. Julie's reading The Olive Farm series by Carol Drinkwater. 
Ace is reading The Number One Ladies Detective Agency by Alexander McCall Smith. Um, Cindy is reading The Witch Elm by Tana French. And Anne is reading A Line to Kill by Anthony Horowitz. I have that as an audiobook to listen to next, hopefully. So I'm looking forward to listening to that, Anne, and hope you're enjoying the book. So that's that's what everyone's reading. Now we need to get on to the books, I think. So the first one I need to talk to you about is In Cold Blood by uh, Adam Croft. Now, my goodness, Adam is um, a legend. He really is. He's published, I don't know, over... Two million books. He sold two million books. He writes a series. He writes standalone. Um, he has helped teach people um, about writing. He helps out, um, educate people about the publishing world. He does so much and he's such a busy man, it seems. There's always something that, that he's working on. And uh, it, it's somebody I've been wanting to talk to on this podcast for a long time because uh, I think he's a, just a very interesting person um, and he presents a podcast with Robert Dawes who's been on this on this podcast as well um, Partners in Crime. So Adam we will be talking to shortly let me tell you about this particular book so In Cold Blood is the third in the Rutland series um, they're fairly short sort of just over 200 pages how much was this one see it, it just flies by so I don't even uh, notice oh gosh I take it all back 281 pages that's gosh it just whizzed by I was enjoying it so much um, so yes th they're short books and they move the story moves quickly which is what I like they've got well-developed characters certainly the ones that move from book to book in in the series um and and I, I like the crime let's read the blurb a body is found under well and viaduct on a bitterly cold winter morning but this will be a murder investigation like no other as di caroline hills and ds dexter antoine begin to unravel the dark secrets in the victim's life they find themselves sucked into a web of lies and betrayal. Rutland police need to find the killer before it's too late. But with Caroline's health failing and their main witness suspiciously missing, the stakes couldn't be higher. Dark histories, mysterious gifts and hidden secrets abound. But will they discover the truth before anyone else is killed in cold blood? Very, very good. Uh, now, first sentence. It's, it's what we do here. So let's get to the first sentence. Here we go. Sean Taylor thrust his hands into his coat pockets, willing them to warm up again. There we go. I'm not going to read any more of that. Just, just get the book and read it. I've reviewed the others in the series already on, on this podcast. I think they're good, short, gripping books. And, and that's all that you want. Um, they're also on uh, on Audible, at least, as audiobooks. I'm sure other places are available and are well narrated there. So, yes, I think we need to just talk to Adam now. So, Adam Croft, author of In Cold Blood, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for asking me. It's a pleasure. Well, it's very good to have have you here. Definitely. Let's talk about the Rutland series. Um, what gave you the idea for, for the series as a whole? Oh, well, it's a place I know very well. It's an area of the country I spend a lot of time in. My parents live there. Mm. Um, I've been visiting long before they, they moved there, years and years. And my, my wife and I got engaged there getting on for 11 years ago now so it's 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 a it's an area i know an area i love and it's always struck me how evocative it is and i'm still not quite sure of what or how but it just seems to have a certain energy about the place that seems to make it ripe for stories and it's a very very low crime area it's um you know, nothing ever really happens there and in a way the way my mind works, that made it even more yes. right for, for setting a crime series there. I love how you take this place that you have, you know, family connections and great memories and then put in lots of murders and crime. Yeah, just, just wade in and kill everyone yeah. else. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and I like how you pay attention to, well, it's a mix. You've got the great location. You've got these very interesting characters and then the mysteries, the crimes to solve as well. When you're starting a book, which comes first? Um, I think for me, the the location and the crime 
seem to come first. They seem to follow a pattern that, that wasn't intended, but which I'm I'm sticking to now, which is that the, the book opens with a character or characters that we never meet again in that book, discovering a body in, in an iconic Rutland location. And the plot kicks off from there. But I think I think you always do center it around characters. I think all books are are character centered in some way. But for me, when I'm first coming up with the ideas, it, it's it's the plot, it's the crime, the reason why, the location, how that links in. And the characters, I don't necessarily know them when I start writing, who they are, where they've come from, how they think, but it it becomes apparent quite quickly when I when I start riffing on that. And the ways in which they react to these situations in these scenes seems to just fall in a little more naturally, I think. I, I, I try not to, to force that aspect mm. too much. I try to prefer to keep things natural if I can. And you've got the two main characters throughout the series, D.I. Caroline Hills and D.S. Dexter Antoine. Mm. When you um, imagine and, and think about what crime, what the mystery will be for the next book, is it then, well, how how are these sort of regulars going to react to it as well? And how do they fit in? Yeah, I think so. It's um, quite, quite a lot of the time it's it's going to be a job for them because they're police officers. So finding a way in which the crime might uh, hit home somehow or mm-hmm. in which the interplay between other characters might hit home for them is is important because you've got to have it affect them in some way or have something else going on in their life, which means investigation is getting in the way or their life's getting in the way of the investigation. Mm. And of course, you've got the age old problem of how do the criminals get away with it for so long? Because in real life, yes. it's, uh, you know, it, it quite often just comes down to fingerprints or forensics or DNA or they're just seen on CCTV, which of course is, um, is not a particularly satisfying end for a crime novel so you've got to work out why these things don't solve it Mm. in a in a new and innovative way each time which when you're 30 books in is is tricky to do and yeah you've got to pace it right and make sure that not only is the reveal and the way in which the crime is solved interesting and something that you, you don't necessarily see coming but which um it happens at the right time as well. You've got to, mm. got to pace that right. I think as time goes on, I'm perhaps keeping them a little, um, yeah, try, trying to keep my power to dry on that front a little bit because I'm, I'm well aware I'm probably starting to run out of options. <laughs> well, uh, what I like, I mean, despite them being uh, on the shorter side, they have so many stages. You know, you go in, and I think, oh yeah, I know who's I know who's done this. And then later on, I think, oh no, 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 it's this person. And then, oh no, it's this person. And it's this sort of constant reveal that keeps me turning the pages. It's, mm. it's so well crafted. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I do try to keep them on the short side, um, mainly because I, I won't put anything in the books that. Don't, doesn't need to be there. I don't have anybody saying to me, it's got to be 80,000 words. It's got to be 120,000 words. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm not forced to sit down and write a chapter about what the guy's having for breakfast, unless it's relevant. If he dies by Cocoa Pops, then fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll describe the Cocoa Pops in great detail in a way that's going to actually help the reader later on. But otherwise, I just prefer to keep the plot moving. I think as long as it's moving the plot, or moving on character development in some way as well as you're finding out more about them in a way which is going to be helpful either for that book's plot or for the series yeah. arc. But um, other than that, I don't like to um, I don't like to include things that don't need to be. And that's not yeah. to say they're action packed and there's gunfights and things on on every page because I I don't think I've written a gunfight in my life. But in terms of story action and moving things forward, I think that's um, that's important. That's why people like to read them and. Yeah. call them page turners and, and and what have you. I think that's that's probably what does it. Yes, every page has its place, has its purpose yeah. in, in, in the story. You've written a number of series and you've written some standalones as well. Is there one that you prefer, series or standalones? Yeah, whichever one I didn't write last, normally. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's um they're, they're nice to yeah, the series are nice to 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 go to because I know the characters, I know where they're going, I know where they've come from and half of it is is in place i guess in my mind mm. whereas with a standalone you're inventing 
a whole new world, whole new characters, entire new cast, the plots, the concepts, even the way and style of writing it can mm. change because you've got free reign to do that. And that's a brilliant thing after you've written a couple of series books. It's nice to have that palette cleanser. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's it's not something you can't write three or four of those in a row. They are, they are hard work. But at the same time, you don't want to get too boxed in with the series no. and to feel too comfortable with it. So that's when I will throw in either a standalone or a, a new series or something to to keep things fresh and to keep myself on my toes. So when you get that idea, the germ of an idea, do you then have to have a conversation with yourself about, well, should I give this idea to to, to the Rutland series or should I do it as a standalone or should I continue one of the other series? Yeah, I think normally there are it, there are some sort of indicators to me as to where it might fit anyway. So there might be just a certain feel about it or an atmosphere about the idea in how it's come into my head, and which means it, it's got a natural home. Sometimes there are things which are completely unrelated and feel like they're not quite slotting in anywhere. And I've got ideas that have been sitting there for eight or nine years in notebooks, still unused because they haven't quite got a home yet, but I know they will have. And sometimes I might just have a character who interests me or something about that character or a secret they have or something they've done or an event that, that happens or a location and, and, nothing else and i'll either build out from there or i'll look at the other notes i've got written down other plots and, and bits and bobs mm -hmm. and other characters and see if there's something which which might fit together there so yeah there's no no real set process i think um but there's always a nugget of some sort that i i will build out from and usually i'll either know that it fits in a certain series or in a certain style or I'll say, actually, next, I want to write a Night and Culver House book. And I haven't yeah. got a specific idea, but I'll look through notebooks and I go, ah, yeah, actually, that one would fit in with you know, a bit of tweaking. Or actually, yeah, that one's perfect. I'll, I'll use that. I'm interested in all these ideas and when, you know, you might be out and see something and think, oh, that'd be a good idea. Because you're so well known as a, a crime thriller writer, do your friends say to you, oh, no, you, you know, something happens. Oh, no, you're going to put that in the book or... Um, not, not so much, really. It's, um, I think, yeah, per yeah, perhaps at first, but I think, um, you know, most of my friends I've known for for years since before I started writing. Anyway, so yeah, it probably was a bit of a joke at first, but um, yeah, no. To be honest, when I'm if I'm not sitting here in the office, then I I don't really talk about the books at all, or or talk about work any more than than most people do. But yeah, I guess the brain's always going and always picking things up, and you know. You've, you overhear somebody talking in a pub and you think they've got an interesting yeah. an interesting outlook an interesting way of thinking about things and yeah the cogs the cogs start turning or you see something or yeah just sort of jot it down on the phone and, and yeah. it goes into that uh that list i was talking about well i always get that when there's a family calamity they say oh no you're gonna you're gonna talk about this in the podcast aren't you uh, yes yeah. <laughs> yes i am yes i am um, i mean it, it does help that none of my friends or family read my books or listen to the <laughs> podcast so they wouldn't know if i did so. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. but i'm interested in that you know being in the office and writing and and what motivates you to write is it well, it's 9 a.m it's time to write or do you still sort of wait for the the muse to strike um it depends how big my overdraft is at the time really <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I um it, yeah it, it it depends sometimes i think actually you know i've got to got to get a couple out here but again i don't like to force yes. writing um if i'm writing a book i'll always sit and write two thousand words a day but it can be you know that can take an hour or it can take i can still be sitting here at two o'clock in the morning but i will do it wow. um and I'll, I'll make sure they're they're decent words. Um, but yeah, sometimes between books, you just you need to have a break. I mean, we're you know, recording here end of August, and I've not written anything since probably beginning of May, around around about that time. Wow. Um, yeah, because there's just been so much other stuff going on and back office things that have needed doing. And yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, I've been working long hours, but um, yeah, just not not really writing the words, which is. It's fine. Sometimes that happens. There are other things that that need to be done, and um, yeah, it's it 
there's no real no real pattern to it no two days are the same but 2000 words a day uh, 2000 good words that that's that's a lot that's you must be quite focused when you do come to write well yeah yeah i've been doing it you know a, a long time now but i think you know, when i start the next one i think after a couple of months of not writing i don't think i'll be necessarily going straight back into 2000 i think it's <laughs> bit like uh, going back to the gym after six months I think maybe yeah. maybe start light and build up from there so what's your go-to if you're struggling to get the words is is it uh, drink a coffee go for a walk put some music on what what what's your go-to well, always drink coffee that's just yeah. um <laughs> th- th- yeah that's just my, my 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 daily routine always got a coffee in my hand um I mean first of all just don't panic it happens um there's nothing I don't think that I don't believe in writer's block as a thing that just creeps up um, on its own. I think it's it's a, a catch-all term we use to just describe any number of reasons why we, you know, things might not be flowing at that time. So don't panic. Don't worry about it. Don't try to look too far into it. You know, take the time. Take the time off mm-hmm. and, you know, have a couple of days where you don't write. Don't pressure yourself over it. Sometimes the more you pressure yourself, the yes. more anxiety you get over it the less likely it is to come because your brain is focused on the the stress Mm. rather than the the creative freedom it needs and I quite often find things will come to me or resolve themselves either just just in the morning it will it it will source itself out the brain is doing these things in the background the whole time you don't you don't realize it but it is it's working out these these plot issues and sourcing them out for you or I can just be pottering around in the garden or quite often in the shower i'll you know i'll just rush out and, and jot something down because you know you're just kind of going through routines your, your brain's not really doing much and it's got a time to to resolve those you know any plot issues or character things and sometimes it can just be another idea something to, to throw in which reignites that that passion for the book and i think if you sit there and get too stressed over it the book will annoy you more than it excites you and I think you have to be excited by a book to to write it and to write it well. Now let's talk self-publishing because you seem to be the king of of self-publishing you have created. This... I will take that title I'll put it on <laughs> on everything from now on. Yeah I'll, I'll I'll give you that I mean it's extraordinary if you were starting out now knowing all that you do would it still be the right route to go down because it, it seems to me that you really know how to make self-publishing you know work for you and you are that sort of focused person but I was just interested if you would still do that yeah it, it's certainly the right thing for me um because um yeah because I don't like other people so you know working on my own is, is ideal <laughs> but uh, I mean I you know I joke but to be honest I I don't I call it indie publishing or independent publishing rather than self-publishing because yes. I mean there, there's no self about it to be honest I mean they're I mean, just even behind the scenes, there are four of us that, you know, I, I, I essentially, I run the publishing company as well as being its sole author. And there are four of us that are working every day mm-hmm. for the company. Um, and that's not including, you know, the cover designers, the um, editors, the formatting, all of those things. And even the the production, the distribution, it's using the exact same methods and the exact same people as the major publishing houses. It's, you know, it's not like I'm um, designing my own covers and editing my own books and then, um, yes. you know, getting a local printer to, to print a couple of hundred copies and storing them in my garage or anything like that. It's it's all going through the exact same processes as the major publishers, um, just obviously on a smaller scale. I'm not I'm not putting out 20 books a month or, or anything like that. Mm. So, yeah, it's um, it, it suits me. It means that, you know, my books are available everywhere that any book would be Mm. it means i can get them out much more quickly in a matter of weeks after they're finished rather than months or even a year or two in in some cases um if it doesn't work then i've got nobody to blame but myself and i'm i'm quite happy blaming myself Mm -hmm. i what i don't like is um you know what falling out with somebody else and thinking it might have been their fault that it's not worked <laughs> if yeah. i can take responsibility for that that's fine i can learn and i can sort that out and i can improve upon it next time um but yeah i don't want to be in a position where i think oh, that would have worked if only so and so had done this yeah um and yeah just that i guess that 
the creative control. Yeah. Being able to, I do have a very um, kind of big picture view of things sometimes. I know how I want things to be and to look and to operate. And if I'm able to actually create that, then then great. It, it suits me suits me down to the ground and traditional publishing is no different really they will still the books will still be produced in the same way they'll still go through the same channels um i'll get a much lower royalty the books will come out much later and you know you still have to do the marketing and the advertising and all of that because unless you're a a massive Mm a-lister the publisher's not going to do it for you anyway yes Yes. And that's what I'm finding more and more that authors are having to do their own publicity and, and not appreciating that that's that's part of it. As you say, mm. just because you've got a publisher doesn't mean you don't have to to do that. It's not just about yeah. writing the book. But I mean, for every for every indie author who comes to me and says, oh, it, it's really not working for me at the moment. I wonder if I should just find a publisher for every one of those. There's got to be 10, 15 traditionally published authors, including some some you know big names who will say i'm just not happy with with what they're doing you know is it is it worth me going indie with this so yeah there's there's definitely a you know the tide's definitely going in one direction yes do you find people approach you to publish their books as well is is that oh yeah yeah not so much i have been asked but yeah, it's not it's not happening. So if you if you're listening to this and yeah. you're doing that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, buy yeah, the I've books. Got more I've got more than enough work on um <laughs> on publishing my own. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, like I say, I don't want to get into um yeah having having those those responsibilities. Yeah, no, I can understand that. Now, um, every week I tell the people on the Quick Book Reviews Facebook group who I'm interviewing and they always come up with questions that they'd like to ask. We've got three questions, if that's okay. Um, yes. The first one is from Vicky. Uh, which of your books is your favourite? She says, mine is In Cold Blood. Oh, thank you. That would um, that would probably be mine as well, Vicky. I always try to make sure that each book I write is better than the previous ones. So logically, I should be saying <laughs> the, the, the most recent book is my favourite or it should at least be the best one. So yeah, I would I would probably agree. I mean, there are, there are lots of books of mine which I'm I'm very fond of that um, perhaps are lesser known ones. Uh, the Kempston Harlwick series, I I really enjoy writing. They're a very very different thing altogether. And yeah, sometimes it's um, especially if you've come from my other books, it can be difficult to uh, sort of tune into the sort of the, the, the quirky humour and the, the tongue in cheek aspect of it. But yeah, I, I really enjoy writing those. So yeah. Very good. Linda says, what can you tell us about your next book? Um, because I believe there's book four of the Rutland series on its way. Um, there will be. There will be. Um, there's nothing on that yet. Um, but yeah, there, there's, there'll be lots more in, in all of the series as well as the, the standalones. But yeah, nothing that I can, not not enough that I can say no. anything now. It's all, it's all very, very liable to change still. <laughs> but the next book that you publish, will that be the Rutland series or could that be something else? Um, I would say it's probable that it would be in the Rutland <laughs> okay. series. But yeah, I, I have had occasions where I've sort of come out and, and, and said that or things like that. And I come across a stumbling block and something else has kind of crept in. And yes, I've gone, of course. Got to get that out. That's that's come pretty much fully formed. And yeah, sometimes things can overtake it, but it's it's certainly in the lead at the moment. Watch watch this space then. Sarah asked a question. I was going to ask this. If if you wrote a book that wasn't a crime or thriller, what would it be? That's a very good question. Um, I here's something I've thought about. I've definitely got things I want to write which aren't crime or thriller. It's it's a case of finding that the right time to do that and how to do that as well. Does it come out under my name? Do I use a different name? Um, and I think it would probably be probably just more sort of mainstream literature, I guess. I, I wouldn't, you know, mm. I don't have a particular genre that I would go into or that I know anywhere near as well as crime and thrillers. So it wouldn't be a sci-fi or a or romance or fantasy or anything like that but i think yeah probably something sort of a, a middle of the road um yeah 
book a prizey type yes type affair but um you know not that it's going to get anywhere near, <laughs> near winning that but yeah i've got a couple of ideas for for, for proper books if you like and i say that again very tongue-in-cheek yes oh that's that's wonderful very very intriguing i mean some crime writers have written books sci-fi books you know crimes based in uh, in space so you, you you never know the rutlands series may go extraterrestrial well yeah maybe maybe <laughs> um yeah i again i just don't I, I they're not other genres are not things that i've really read enough to mm. pretend that i could even have a go at it um and yeah when it comes to space i mean my son is massively massively into space he's always telling me facts about obscure moons of other planets and wow. orbits of this and that so yeah i might um yeah if the sci-fi bug does rear its head then i'll i'll certainly tap him up as a as yes an a collab you could do a yeah. collaboration <laughs> yeah. between the two of you that'd be great yeah. um my last question is with all your experience and and all the books that you've published is there anything that still surprises you or shocks you about the writing world yeah i'm constantly learning and, and being surprised every day to be honest um i think the the unpredictability of it is is always interesting. You think you know that a book is either going to land well or or won't land well, mm. and I'm constantly surprised by what actually does do well. Sometimes, so when people are coming out saying, "Oh, this will be the next big hit," you, yes. don't, you don't know. I mean, you know, quite often, if you know, depending on who says that, that can cause it to be, but you can't you can't predict what people are going to buy because. If you could, then every book would be a would be a bestseller, and people wouldn't be writing the things that weren't going to land. So yeah, they're just not knowing what audiences and readers are going to respond to is always something that amazes me and scares me as well. Um, and yeah, just I guess some areas of the industry just how slow it still is, and how, yeah. how behind the times some things are. Considering indie publishing is not new; it's been majority of the industry both in terms of books sold books published money mm. earned however you look at it it's 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 the main part of the industry and has been for years but there's just some aspects that haven't quite caught up and that are still mm. very very stuck in the past and aren't really thinking forward they're just kind of reacting to to what's happened and what people have done before rather than thinking about where we need to be going next but yeah that's um probably getting a bit too philosophical for now no it's just it's just so interesting and and adam i just appreciate uh your your time today talking to me i think in cold blood's a absolutely super book and uh yeah adam croft thank you for joining me today oh thank you for having me well that was very interesting wasn't it so adam croft author of in cold blood and now we move on to another book very interesting one. So this is called Slow Fire Burning and it's by Paula Hawkins. Um, a slow fire burning, I should say. Now, I got to listen to this on audiobook ahead of publication date, which was great. Now, Paula Hawkins, we, we know everyone has everyone's heard or read or watched the film of Girl on a Train. Um, and the trouble is when you've written a book so... Um, widely known and respected as that, it's always hard to write the next book. Now, I admit, I haven't, I didn't read uh, Paula's next one. Um, so this was my next um, offering of Paula's that I wanted to, to read and to listen to. And I admit I was a bit dubious because I thought, can somebody write something as good as that first one? Can she pull it off again? The short answer is, Yes, she can. But let me give you a slightly long answer than that. So here's here we go. Here is the blurb. Laura has spent most of her life being judged. She's seen as hot tempered, troubled, a loner. Some even call her dangerous. Miriam knows that just because Laura is witness leaving the scene of a horrific murder with blood on her clothes, that doesn't mean she's a killer. Bitter experience has taught her how, how easy it is to get caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. Carla is reeling from the brutal murder of her nephew. She trusts no one. Good people are capable of terrible deeds. But how far will she go to find peace? Innocent or guilty, everyone is damaged. Some are damaged enough to kill. Right, what's the first line? Mm. 
Oh, well, first sentence, there's only two words in the very first sentence. So we're going to do the first two sentences, even though they're quite short. Blood sodden. The girl staggers into the black. OK, this book is not a simple book. It is not one that will sort of give you um, an ABC guide to a crime. This is a complex, twisting, moody, uh, thoughtful story. And there were times in it when I was like, oh, my goodness, what is what is what's going to happen? How is this going to work out? What is this book? What will I, how will I describe this book? And the reward at the end and being able to look back at the whole story um, is, is very strong. I'd say it's a it's a really good book. It's a stunning book. Um, it's uh, almost a work of art in it, in itself, but it is not the Topsy and Tim, Janet and John guide to crime writing. Not that any of the books are that I'm reviewing here today, um, but this one particularly is a is a technical book, and I think that's why some people may just jump in and say, "Oh gosh," because it it does take some some time and some focus uh, but I thought it was I thought it was really good I really enjoyed listening to it as an audiobook whether that adds more to it than reading it I, I couldn't say um, but it showed me that Paula is not a one book one strong book author um, very very good and I want to know what she's writing next because clearly it's going to be great so that was very good um now, what are we going to, which one are we going to do next? Let's have a change from crime and let's do, see, can you hear me lift, lifting all the books? Sorry. Um, Yours Cheerfully by A.J. Pierce. Now, A.J. Pierce wrote the book Dear Mrs. Bird. Um, you, you probably, oh, I don't know if I've talked about Dear Mrs. Bird on the podcast. This podcast has only been going two years. Did I review it on there? Can't remember. Anyway, Dear Mrs. Bird, uh, Yours Cheerfully is just a lovely book about a girl pursuing her dream to work in journalism and getting um, involved in answering readers' questions. It's written in the nine, early 1940s, so in, in the time of the Second World War, in the UK. And yes, it's a sort of jolly hockey sticks book, but there's a lot more to it. It is about, and, and this one is about feminism, even at that time. Um, and it's about, despite awful things happening, keeping bright when you can and um, seeing the joy in life. Let, let me read you the blurb. Oh, and I have to say, I have to say that my copy of this book is so beautiful because the, the um, pages have been sprayed with the, it's the same colour. So the book is pink and there's this old fashioned typewriter on it. And that is all sprayed along the edges of the book. It's gorgeous. It's, it's a stunner. Um, it, but anyway, sorry. Yes, I'm, I was about to go off at yet another tangent. I will rein that tangent in for now. Here is the blurb. London, September 1941. Following the departure of the formidable editor Henrietta Bird from Woman's Friend magazine, things are looking up for Emmeline Lake as she takes on the challenge of becoming a young wartime advice columnist. Her relationship with boyfriend Charles, now stationed back in the UK, is blossoming, while Emmy's best friend Bunty is still reeling from the very worst of the Blitz, but bravely looking to the future. Together, the friends are determined to make a go of it. When the Ministry of Information calls on Britain's women's magazines to help recruit desperately needed female workers to the war effort, Emmy is thrilled to be asked to step up and help. But when she and Bunty meet a young woman who shows them the very real challenges that women workers face, Emmy must tackle a life-changing dilemma between doing her duty and standing by her friends. Every bit as funny, heartwarming and touching as dear Mrs Bird, yours cheerfully is a wonderful celebration of friendship, a tribute to the strength of women and the importance of lifting each other up even in the most challenging times. And yes, I agree. So this book follows on almost immediately after Dear Mrs Bird. Um, and Yours Cheerfully is, is a lovely, happy book. It taught me um, some things I didn't know about the Second World War, about the... Well, I don't want to give it too much away, but about the problems that um, women in particular uh, experienced during that time when they wanted to work and, and there were other commitments. Yeah, it, I don't want to say anymore. It's 
OK, it, if you like um, the miseducation of Evie Epworth, if you like Mrs. Benson's Beetle, um, this is one of those sort of feel good but major stories going on and uh, just takes you out of the here and now. I admit I didn't think it was quite as good as um, Dear Mrs. Bird, but I don't know. I don't know why I'm saying that. I think the trouble is when it's a follow on, you expect it to be immediately funny and hilarious and captivating. And it took me a while to get into it. Now, that's not the book's fault. That's my fault. It's expectations again, isn't it? So it it was really good, but it wasn't amazing as, as the first. But I thought it was still really good. So do read it and let me know. Tell me I'm wrong. Please do. Please do. Anyway, now we go on to Next of Kin by Kia Abdullah. Oh, my goodness. The minute I heard about the premise of this story, I was telling my daughter all about it. And we're both saying, gosh, that is so different. And that's a book to be read. You, you're not you're not going to believe this. Oh, I didn't do the first sentence from yours cheerfully, did I? <gasps> sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's see, right. Uh, it's it's a well, it's not a long one, but it's a bit longer than some. Here we go. This is the first sentence of yours cheerfully. As Mr. Collins called the start to the woman's friend editorial meeting, to anyone watching, it was a perfectly normal Monday morning affair. Oh, I want to read you more because the rest of that first paragraph is lovely. Do I say, can I say the rest of this? I'm going to say the rest of this first paragraph because I haven't been um, saying how incredible this book is. And I think this first paragraph shows you it is. Kathleen had handed out the agenda. Each member of staff had a folder full of their notes. And as usual, Mrs Bustle had brought teas up to the fifth floor, despite the stairs playing havoc with her unpredictable leg. I mean, it's, it's glorious, isn't it? Yeah, I, OK, I'm changing my mind. I did really like that one. You see? <laughs> who, who knows? And this is Philippa operating again without coffee. You, you, you hear me at, at, at my worst. So anyway, let's go on to Next of Kin with this incredible premise. Uh, listen to this. On an ordinary working day, Leila Saeed receives a call that cleaves her life in two. Her brother-in-law's voice is filled with panic. His son's nursery is called to ask where little Max is. Leela was supposed to drop Max off that morning, but she forgot. Racing to the car park, she grasped the horror of what she's done. Max has been locked in her car for six hours on the hottest day of the year. But she's too late. What follows is an explosive high-profile trial that will tear the family apart. But as the case progresses, it becomes clear there's much more to this incident than meets the eye. Wow. So this is out 2nd of September. I mean, can you imagine, you know, can you imagine having a child in the car, just forgetting that they're there, caught up in your day, and then hours later on a hot day, you... Um, Recall the fact that you have the child in the car and the child is dead. I mean, it it's it's unbelievable. And yet the book is so good. We have had Kia on the podcast before. Um, she is a, a fresh UK legal crime writer and she can write very skillfully. They're great books, standalone, really, really good. And this one was more of it, more revelations, more wow moments and just that premise i mean talk about an elevator pitch that it's i just thought it's incredible and it's out 2nd of september so uh depending on what day you're listening to this podcast it will be uh very very soon so it's well worthwhile ordering that one a fatal mistake two sisters torn apart yeah, I just very, very good. How how Kia gets ideas like those? I don't know, but I thought it was great. Um, and now on to the last book for today. Oh, my goodness, Philippa. I didn't do the first sentence, did I? Do you know, I really, I really just worry about myself sometimes. I'm so caught up in the next book and the next book and I don't give it enough time. So let's find that first sentence for you now. It was a strange thing to be jealous of your sister, yet perfectly natural at the very same time. Good book, good book. 
uh, a book to remember. And um, oh yeah, it's that premise. Wow. Anyway, right. Last book, The Flight by Julie Clark. This is a good one. Listen to this. Claire and Eva lead very different lives, but they have one thing in common. They are both in huge danger and need to disappear. A chance encounter at the airport presents the two women with a simple but crazy solution. Switch flights, then drop off the grid when they land. But one woman will never reach her destination. Right, let's do the first uh, sentence before I forget, because it's entirely likely. So this is the, the prologue. Um, and I, I think I will read what it says because... Uh, yeah, OK. So this is set at John F. Kennedy Airport, New York, Tuesday, the Feb Tuesday, February 22nd, the day of the crash. Terminal four swarms with people, the smell of wet wool and jet fuel thick around me. Um, I thought this was a really good book. I feel uncomfortable reading books where... Pe women are scared of their husbands or people are scared of their partners. That makes me feel uncomfortable. But that's that's only part of it. And it's a, a it's a great thriller. And it's one that you just, you know, you're rooting for the bad guys to get their comeuppance. You're rooting for everything to be OK. And it's got the payoff that you want. It's nice at a time when I can't fly anywhere to read a book about flights that you think, well, once more, I'm very glad that I'm not on that flight. And uh, yeah, I thought it was a really, really good book. Highly commended. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, this this week, they're all excellent. Normally, I've got one I'm moaning about, but actually, I, I can't moan about any of them. So we've got A Slow Fire Burning um, by... Paula Hawkins, In Cold Blood, Adam Croft, Yours Cheerfully by A.J. Pierce, Next of Kin by Kia Abdullah and The Flight by Julie Clark. So that's it for this week. Now, we do have a book box um, opening, but if it's not your cup of tea, we will bid each other farewell now. If it is your cup of tea, then let's let's carry on and see where this where, where this gets to us. So I I'm just going to get the box now. Right. So here we are. I love these book boxes. <laughs> it is like Christmas. This is one I had never heard of until someone said, oh, what about this? They do really good things. And I said, right, let's give them a try. It's called Secondhand Bookshelf. Um, and it says on the side of the box, changing the planet one book at a time. Um, they usually just do seasonal boxes, so it's not monthly. And uh, if you're new to discovering book boxes, this is something you can subscribe to. And they might be sent out every month or two, three months, whatever. Um, and there will be lots of surprises in there. There'll be a book that you don't know what you're getting and all sorts of things. Um, with this one, I had to put in what sort of books that I like, what books I'd read, which was a bit hard for me because if I would listed down all the books I'd read, I would have had to have uh, attached one of my spreadsheets, which poor people at Secondhand Bookshelf would not, would not want to receive. So it's a secondhand book and bits and bobs. Um, I've no idea what it's going to be. It's probably going to be a book that I've had already um, because I've had so many. But we never know. And I'm just excited to see what this is all about. So this is the autumn box. And I'm opening this on a day when it's pouring with rain. It's very misty outside. So it's a good autumnal day to open it. So here we go. I'm just opening it. It's a cardboard box, of course. Um, very good. And I'm opening it up. Oh, and there's newspaper in it. Very good. Um, and there's a little card saying, thank you so much for your order and supporting a small business. And then we've got something about what to do in, in autumn and about pumpkins. Lovely. And then just a little something to say, oh, this is nice. This is a lovely little sort of handwritten note just saying, oh, about the book. Here we go. The book I've chosen for you is a thriller by an author you've recently enjoyed. Oh, my goodness. I hope you haven't read it yet and will like it just as much. Oh, my goodness. That is not lovely. I'm very intrigued by this. So there's newspaper. So I'm going to lift the newspaper off. Sorry for the sound effects. And then I can see what's inside. Oh, my goodness. This is wonderful. Oh, this looks beautiful. Oh, I don't know where to start. There's pots and all. OK, come on, Philippa. First thing. 
And this I need so badly. Honestly, I know I sound like a child. Uh, I, I do apologise, but this is all very exciting. So this is um, Circular and Co, the world's first cup made from used cups. Um, and it's like a coffee cup. This is very good because I did have one, but I lost the inner bit so it kept leaking everywhere and I couldn't take my cup of coffees uh, my cup of coffee with me and as we all know Philippa needs her cup of coffee this is 100% leak proof uh, 360 degree drinking oh so you can drink it from you don't need to line your mouth up to the hole ever so good insulated designed for 10 years use oh my goodness it's lovely what is circular it gives waste worth the thermal outer layer of this cup is made from used cups increasing their value and life from 10 minutes to 10 years circular helps prevent millions of cups being lost into the environment and because it's 100% recyclable the circle will continue dishwasher safe top shelf i like how they said what shelf i didn't even know that was a that was a thing i'm i love that so um the cup is uh, how you'd imagine a sort of fairly small coffee sized cup um with a, a cream main body and then the lid is sort of a, a dark gray and black that's lovely i like that very much um oh, what do i open next okay here's a here's a big black pot it's quite heavy uh, circular oh, candle forest a soy candle shall i open it have a smell forest i'm not is that going to smell of mold let's have let's have a smell oh that's lovely that smells natural it's it's like it's something i think you'd have in the bathroom it's very clean smell oh it's just lovely it's almost like um an aqua smell or i don't oh it's lovely I don't know what it is, but it's lovely. I'm going to put the lid back on. It's a substantial candle as well, which is great. Not a little squitty one. Um, really, really love that. Excellent. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to have to keep having these boxes. Now, what's this next one? This is a little a little pot. Um, Bewitched Pumpkin, the Upton Cauldron. And it's a hand-poured scented soy candle. So this is a smaller one, but it's a pumpkin candle. Oh, that's lovely. I was a bit worried because the only time I've really experienced pumpkin is um, when I went to one of the coffee shops. Was it Starbucks or something a few autumns ago in the time when I could without face masks and all of that. And uh, I had something with pumpkin in and they gave it to me and there were all these like these bits swirling around. I just thought, oh, that doesn't look very nice. But this... This smells lovely. I really like that. Oh, my goodness. Two candles and a coffee cup. Cool. Uh, right. Next one. What's this? Oh, another another candle. This is <laughs> this is another one by the Upturned Cauldron and it's called Poison Apple. So I'm presuming it's an apple smell. Lovely. Oh, yes. Now, I like that because it's not like a, a chemical apple smell. It's a very natural smell. That's lovely. Oh, my house is going to be smelling nice. Maybe someone's trying to tell me something. You have a smelly house and you need to light those candles. I don't know. Now, what's this? Oh, hello. Get this. Littles chocolate chai. Flavour infused instant coffee. Now, I'm not an instant coffee fan, but I think I might need to be. And it's a, a lovely glass jar. Ah, the lid's on sealed for tight, so I can't smell it. I bet that smells so good. I want to have that. 100% uh, um, Arabaca coffee. Is that how you say it? Anyway, gently infused with chocolate and classic Indian chai spices. No added sugar. Four calories a cup. See, now we're talking. I'll just put that lid back on. Oh, it's lovely. I am enjoying that. So sorry for the noise as I put them all down. Let me go rootling again. I think we're, are we nearly there? Is there anything else left? Let's see. I think there's one more thing. Oh, yes. Yes. Now this, this is right up Philippa Street. Pure heavenly salted caramel flavour, milk chocolate alternative, dairy free, only 2% sugar, palm oil free, gluten free, soy free. Let's hope it's not taste free. It won't be. It's going to be gorgeous. I just know it. They wouldn't have it in this box otherwise. I just, I already trust them implicitly about this. Um, so let's see I think that's everything I'm just going through it is like all the bits of paper are cut up into such little squiggly worms it's like doing the, the lucky dip from a long time ago um, so let's see 
that oh that's just some guidance for the candle so now right here we go mystery crime thriller by the author of lies the holiday and many more ah yeah ed is delighted to meet his daughter's fiance for the first time but something doesn't seem quite right. For reasons of his own, Ed digs into Ryan's past. He knows a monster when he sees one. Yes, yeah, so I I know what this is. This is the TM Logan one. We had Tim on. Gosh, I was going to say a few weeks ago, but it's a bit longer than, than that. Um, but uh, yes, ah, the cat. Yes, I, I'm so sorry I have read this one. But it's a great book. And actually, what I'm going to do... That's lovely. I thought it would be like a real second hand book, but that's that's brand new. That is brand new. I'm going to um, offer this as a giveaway. So uh, if you go on to the Facebook group for the Quick Book Reviews podcast, if you've made it this far on the podcast, uh, if you go on, I'll be running later in the week um, a giveaway for this book, The Catch by T.M. Logan, Tim Logan. Ah, oh, I'm sorry. I've already read that one. What a, what a shame. But as I say, I wasn't expecting it to be a book that, that I hadn't read. But I think that is a lovely, lovely box. I had heard that there were clothes with it and that the, there doesn't seem to be in this box. Um, but what I've got is just lovely stuff. Three lovely candles, um, a lovely coffee cup, the chocolate, the, the coffee and the book. I think that's really good. And um it's nice to have something that's more that well that isn't YA um, and that isn't fantasy because a lot of the subscription boxes, as we know, are, are, are fantasy. So yes, excellent. Um, I would really recommend that. So uh, I need to find their website. Right here we go. So the website is www.shop.theliterarytraveller. Dot co dot uk so that's shop dot the literary traveler dot co dot uk go and have a look and see what you think i'm thrilled with that i think it'd be a lovely present for someone as well to give a box like that um really high quality items yeah great stuff so there there we go anyway there's a book box <laughs> i've been a child again um and uh, just you take care and uh I'll see you next week. Oh, my goodness. Great author interview next week. Well, hopefully I haven't interviewed them yet, but I know who I'm going to interview. So uh, it's a great author that I will be interviewing. Some splendid books to talk to you about and uh, just lots more fun. So look after yourselves and I'll see you very soon. Take care now. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one ever. See you again soon.